My name is Jewel and I'll be the one narrating our slideshow today. Raw land development. Planning the build. Our step-by-step -step guide for our metal building. In today's video, we will be covering surveys, zoning, soil test, septic design, clearing trees and stumps, building estimate, underground plumbing, foundation, permits, building install. Now here's a disclaimer. This isn't the exact way to develop raw land. This is the way that we did it, how we went about constructing our building, prepping the site, the company that we went through, the permits that we had to get. So if you're looking at doing something like we did, then this is a great video for you. After we purchased our land, we got a survey because we wanted to make sure we knew what the property lines were. Here is an image of the survey of our plot. The main thing what we wanted to know was where our lot lines were and how big was the actual parcel. We also do have a creek running through our property. When a surveyor comes through, he will put stakes in the ground on each corner and then from one corner to another corner, he'll mark along trees with ribbon so that you know exactly where your line is. It's really good to have. The last survey for this property was done in 1998 so we wanted to make sure that we had an up-to-date survey to know exactly where our property lines were and how big the parcel was. It was advertised actually as 11.76 acres and as we discovered after getting the survey done it was really 9.5 acres so again another important reason for getting a survey done on your property surveys cost a few thousand dollars i think we paid around four thousand dollars for ours it's important to know your property lines what's yours which trees are on your property we have some big beautiful beautiful pine trees and we're so happy to know after we got our survey done which ones are on our property and which ones aren't this is great for when you want to put up a fence as well because you do not want to intrude on your neighbor's property and it's also good for privacy we actually put up no trespassing signs private property signs around the corners of our property. You also want to know what your property is zoned for. Ours was zoned for F1, Forestry District. Why it's important to know what the zoning is is because this entails what you can build on that property. There's certain limitations and setbacks and all of these guidelines that you have to follow. Here we have our county's planning and zoning information sheet and this is for F1 Forestry District. As you can see, I've highlighted here that we can have one and two family year round or seasonal dwellings, also private garages and carports. Our building is classified as an accessory building with a convenience bathroom. Because we didn't want it to be our primary residence or dwelling, we had it made as that. And in the future, we are going to be putting up a one or a two family private dwelling, whatever we decide, that's a little bit later on. Over here, you can see in this chart certain setback and dimensional requirements. So the maximum building height that we can have is 35 feet. The building that we have right now to the peak, it's 17 feet. So we are well within those requirements. Also things like minimum lot area with sewer, lot width, setbacks from lakes or rivers. You have to put your building a certain distance from bodies of water for safety reasons and things like minimum lot line setbacks. So again, this is why it's important to have your survey because then you know where your lot lines are. So from the front lot line, your building must be 30 feet back. From the rear, the principal building must be 40 foot and also the accessory building must be 40 foot from the rear. And the sides, uh, principal building 10 foot and accessory building 5 foot. So we are well, well within those setback requirements. So after we got our survey done, we moved on to getting a soil test because this was the next thing that we had to get done on our checklist. The soil test is needed in order to determine the composition of the soil and if it can properly support a foundation. Where we are, we have very sandy soil. The licensed guy who came out to do the soil test, 
he, they went and dug three holes in three different areas of the property and took some samples of the soil and measured the depth of where it's very sandy to where it got to more thicker soil. That helps them determine where we can put our septic system. Our proposed building site was here and there is some elevation changes going down to the right of the building. So we had to make sure we were a certain distance away from that. And the blue marker right here is a benchmark for the licensed plumber who's going to need this lot plan for when they're placing the septic. There was an existing electrical panel there, 200 amp. That was a really, really great bonus because to run electrical out there is kind of a lot of money. Um, it's an additional expense that you have to consider when you are purchasing raw land and wanting to develop on it. Getting a soil test done is usually a necessary part of getting a building permit. Uh, everywhere is different. For us, where we are in our county, yes, it was necessary. Before before we got the septic, we had to get a septic design drawn up and this is what's given to a licensed plumber so that they know where to place the septic tank, the leach field, and what type of tank and the filters and all of those components. The same guy who did our soil test was also licensed and able to do our septic design. It kind of looks the same, but there's just a little bit more details on here. As you can see, it says 11 infiltrator quick four plus standard chambers. That is the leach field right there, that longer looking rectangular with stripes in it. And then the proposed septic tank was to be right here and that's the infiltrator im540 with polylock 122 again these are details that are necessary for the licensed plumber this is a good visual representation of the septic tank and the leach field placement again given to a licensed plumber who will install the septic system this is the septic design information sheet so this shows the number of bedrooms for us it's not that it was a bedroom it's that we had one room that was like an office and then we had a convenience bathroom with that which you're allowed to have at least in our county and with this number of bedrooms the estimated flow which is the gallons per day and peak flow so 100 gallons per day estimated peak 150 gallons the septic tank model and capacity as you can see up here infiltrator 540 that means actually it's 540 gallons the capacity it could hold the filter would be polylock pl-122 the service frequency so in our county where we are it is required to be inspected or emptied once every three years which is actually pretty great and i heard the service isn't even that much anyways the design that we got with the septic tank and the leach field it doesn't fill up as much as a standard holding tank the with the leach field it'll allow the liquids to drain out safely into the ground and dissipate into the earth and then the actual septic tank will fill up with more solids whereas the holding tank the storage tank that fills up with both the liquids and the solids so it fills up a lot quicker we didn't need that for our building we were able to get the septic tank and the leach fields so that worked out great in order for you to get the septic system installed you do need to get a sanitary permit from the county that's why all of this information is necessary to get the soil test and have the septic design and then this is given to the licensed plumber and in our case he took it to the county and he was able to get the sanitary permit for us the permit is an additional charge for us we had to pay 425 dollars on top of what we had to pay the licensed plumber for his work after we got the septic system installed our next step was clearing the land so what was great about the first guy who did our soil test and the septic design he had someone come with him who had a backhoe to dig the holes that same guy we connected with and he was able to clear the land 
for us. And he lived close by, so it all worked out really well. He just drove his backhoe right over. Before we went ahead with hiring someone to do this work, we roughly mapped out where our building site was going to be and the driveway that we wanted leading to it. We marked the trees to be removed with blue and red ribbon. We hired a local contractor. Again, it was the same guy who dug the holes for the soil test. He cleared out 35 trees and stumps. Let me tell you, that was a lot. This area that you can see on this image right here was completely full with trees and huge stumps in the ground. So he did a really good job of leveling out the land and and making it a beautiful building site for us. This is what it looked like before. If you can see right here, that's the electrical box. And we marked out where our driveway was going to be with some markers in the ground. And as you can see on the trees that we wanted removed, we put some red ribbon around those ones. Where that bobcat is over there, that's when we were getting our septic tank installed. But as you can see, the area is full of greenery and life and trees and shrubs and subs. This is another shot of uh, the entrance, the driveway coming in. Again, it's just full with trees in there. And we marked some of them with blue tape. And this is it afterwards, so he did a really good job for us. If you can see the reference point of the electrical box right there, and all of the work that he did, he cleared out here, he cleared out all over here to the right, and then on the left over here in between these trees. So when we drive in, there's a loop around, there's actually two loop rounds that you can make. It turned out really well. After we had all of this done, it was time for us to start looking for our building. I mean, we were the whole time, but once we finally got it all together, this is what it looked like. So we were going for a metal building. Midwest Steel Carports has a 3D building simulator, which is fantastic because you can see what your proposed building is going to look like and then they'll send you this estimate showing um, the custom design that you made. After going back and forth and doing probably 10 or 15 of these, at first we wanted windows and doors and all this other stuff installed, but then we came to the conclusion that we're gonna do that later because we don't exactly know where the placement is going to be. So for now, we just got a frame out of a garage door and we also got a frame out of a walk-in door. So the total size of the building was 30 foot wide by 50 foot long and 12 foot high. At the peak, again, it went to 17 feet. It's made with 12 gauge steel, which is the stronger option, either 14 gauge or 12 gauge. We opted for the 12. Again, a 16 by 10 garage door frame out. A 36 inch by 108 inch walk-in door frame out. We got the horizontal siding with the vertical roofing. The vertical roofing is better for if it's snowing or raining or anything, then everything will just drain off the roof. The colors that we got was charcoal gray for the roof, the trim, and the wainscot, which is the second color along the building, as you can see. And we got pewter gray as the color for the main siding. We got color matching screws with it, concrete anchors. It came building engineer certified. It came with a 20 year warranty. This cost a total of $30,193.60. We did put a down payment of $4,600 or something like that. And we paid the remaining balance when they came and installed the building. They came out and installed this building in a day and a half. It took three guys. They had all of the pieces on the back of their trailer and they just put it up in a day and a half. It was very quick and we were absolutely amazed by how fast that they did it and how beautiful it turned out. Once we got the building estimate done, we were communicating with Midwest Steel Carports this whole time and they were telling us the next steps of what we needed to do before we could get put on the schedule. We needed to have our underground plumbing put in first before we could get our concrete slab foundation poured and then the building to be installed. The underground plumbing consisted of drain lines and hot and cold water lines. We made some rough plumbing drawings showing the placement of the drains. We had to communicate with the concrete contractor to put up the concrete slab foundation 
forms before we could do the underground plumbing. This is because the plumbers need to know exactly where the slab is going to be and where the placement are, of the drains are going to be from the walls from the sides of the building. We had one main drain dug from the building to the septic tank. There was five drains total in the building. This was in the utility room, in the shower, for the bathroom sink, for the kitchen sink. And so those all connected to the main drain line. And finally, there was one in the garage that had its own separate drain line dug to the outside. We also ran hot and cold water lines, which we later decided to close off. And instead we installed the mana block hex crimp system. The reason that we did this is because the concrete with the hex lines were sitting out in the sun for a couple months before we got our actual building installed. And we read online that this can cause the hex lines to leach harmful chemicals and it could go into the water and we didn't want any of that. We wanted to do it a little bit differently anyways after the fact. So whatever we learned from it, we ended up just closing them off and we installed the mana block hex system, which worked out so much more beautifully than we could have imagined. And we did it ourselves <laughs> again, which was incredible. We also had to install an underground pipe for the future well main water line to be ran to the inside of the building. At that time, we didn't have the well dug and we needed to make sure that there was going to be an entry point from the outside to the inside of the building and we didn't want to have to drill a hole into the side of the building later on. So this avoided that and it keeps everything underground below frost level. Next, it was time for the concrete foundation to be poured. The total size of the concrete slab foundation was 30 foot 2 inches by 50 foot 2 inches. You want to leave a couple extra inches around what the original proposed building size would be. That is just what we are instructed to do and I believe that it gives the people who are going to install the building some extra room just in case everything isn't perfectly lined up and it worked out well for us. The concrete slab had 18 18 inch deep by 12 inch wide perimeter footings. The actual slab itself was four inches thick. They used R10 250 PSI insulation under the slab with rebar to hold it all together. We didn't originally plan this, but we asked the concrete contractor if he would be able to pour in a 10 by 30 driveway lip on the front of our building. So he actually did have enough of the concrete left over in the machine. So he was able to do that for us. Again, that was another great bonus. This concrete slab was about almost $11,000. So you do want to account for that as well. So the permits that you needed to do all this was the sanitary permit. This is obtained by a licensed plumber before installing the septic system. Again, the fee was about $425 for us. Then you have to obtain a land use permit. The process for us was we had to complete a permit application and pay a fee to the local county office. I believe it was around $50. And then we have to apply for a fire number along with that if you don't already have one. This is required for first structure on site. If you don't know what the fire number is, that's basically just your address. Another $50, I think. The land use permit tells you what the land can be used for and the minimum requirements when putting up a structure. For example, this is the permit that our county issued us, and as you can see in these highlighted notes, the following minimum requirement must be met for all land uses, private road, building height shall not exceed 35 feet. This is kind of like that other piece of paper that we saw before that was saying what the zoning setbacks were because it's specific to this county and what their rules and ordinances are. This is the actual building permit, which again, you need to pay another fee. I think this one was probably $50 as well. You must submit all three of these permits to Midwest Steel before they actually put you on the schedule. These permits ensure that the work to be done is going to comply with all the local ordinances. They want to make sure that you did your due diligence and you communicated with your county so they know that this building is going up and that everything is legal and to code. Once we had all of those things done, 
it was time for our building install. Our building was installed in October of 2021. 30 by 50 by 12. These are the steps that we went through to get our building installed. We got the land cleared, the septic system installed, the underground plumbing, concrete slab foundation, permits, and then about two weeks later, we had a hundred foot well dug and put in. Our property is kind of high from the water level, which is why it was about a hundred feet. This is another thing of researching the land that you're going to buy. You want to see if there's any existing farmlands around you because farms use pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, whatever to spray on their crops. These are going to leach into the grounds that water carries this throughout the surrounding land so if you're close to that that can leach into your water supply yes you want to get a water filter we are actually on a fresh springs creek so the water that we get is literally fresh spring water some of the contractors who came had told us that we are going to absolutely love this water because it's so good so clean and so clear and they said your pipes will never rust either. <laughs> That's the steps that we went through to get to the point from once we purchased the land to putting up our building. Now it's time for customization. That's gonna be covered in another video. This includes things like our garage door, our walk-in doors, our windows, the interior framing, the indoor plumbing, the electrical work. There's a lot that you have to do when you're building your own place. It's definitely a journey, but it's so worth it because to see something constructed from literally nothing to now there's this beautiful big building there. I mean, we're not even done yet, but we know we have the vision in mind for once we're finished, it's going to be absolutely incredible. Not only the building, but the property that we have. It's nine and a half acres of private, secluded, forced. There's all this wildlife there, deer, and there's bears on our property. Yeah, it's going to be absolutely great. So thank you everyone again, as always, for watching our videos. It's been a pleasure to have you here with us today. We look forward to seeing you in our next video. Bye!